John Henry. Before he comes here, while he's putting his mic on, we sure do look forward to this every King James Bible Conference, and um, it's exciting. It's exciting for us. I trust you came ready to just stay in and not looking to get out and see, ask what the Lord has for us, and I know he has something for us, and all you had to wait this morning for you, you know, you don't like singing early because it's your morning voice and you sound different. I got the same voice the whole time. Doesn't matter morning, noon, or night, man. I can sing and it all comes out the same. You're all worried about your voice cracking and, you know, can I hit the note? Can I not hit the note? And just let her fly. And uh, it gets to the ears of God the right way. He can tune it, tune it just perfectly from a heart that loves him there. So I appreciate you singing this morning. Everybody has their favorite preachers. Everybody has their ones that they like to listen to and stuff like that. And so... I get the privilege to listen to my favorite preacher live today, and uh, I listen to him a lot. I like his old stuff. I like his, good, his new stuff. But when I, when I need my face ripped off, I go back to the old days. And I love it when I click on, the, on the, whatever that button is, the play button. And nowadays, they have like a bar that goes across that gives you volume. I like it when I get one of his messages, and they're all just right there. Those, those are the ones that when I just need my, just, just, just what I need, and sometimes I need it. I got a flesh like you got a flesh. I go back as far as it'll take me back and let me uh, listen to those, some of those things. And then, then when I want to be brought down, I put on Bob Jones Sr. or something like that with that nice voice, and it just kind of takes me down and makes me feel good and brings me back to where I need to. <laughs> I'm just kidding, preacher. <laughs> you, you've helped me more than you ever know you helped me there, but that is a blessing. And it's a blessing that he's with us today. So I trust you have your Bibles ready, your notebooks ready in the morning here, and then you'll be preaching to us again tonight. So Brother David Peacock from Bible Believers Baptist Church, Jacksonville, Florida. Thank you, sir. From whoever that is to Bob Jones Sr. <laughs> the left, the left. I, th I, think that's called, I think that's called old age is yeah. what that is. Maybe uh, maybe learned a little bit of grace over time, and maybe have learned to been seasoned just a tad. I, I hope at least some to a certain degree. First Corinthians chapter number three. Appreciate the privilege of coming last year. I guess we got hung up with the the virus thing, and uh, I know that that's a serious thing. I don't intend to make light of it, but sometimes I feel as if uh, they've made a little too much out of it. And, uh, but one of the things it has done is it has sort of uh, given all of us as Christians maybe two things to think about, one of which is the fact I assume that the majority of you here are saved. You're here on a Thursday morning for a meeting with a few of us gathered together, so you, you've got to be saved or crazy one. You can be saved and crazy, but you know, but, and, and so then the second thing would be, so talking about the natural, the unsaved, practical life. Uh, one of the things that's gotten tested during the virus uh, the stuff that use that term, you can be saved and not be a Christian. Amen. Being saved means I'm eternally secure, I'm safe in the arms of Jesus. It's called standing in state in the Bible. I covered that a couple of years ago, but just kind of real quickly, I give you this idea for those that are not familiar with that term. Standing in state is, is like uh, last week I got on a plane to go to Ohio and I got in the plane in Jacksonville and I guess flew over four or five states. I was flying over different states but I was in the same place in the airplane. So now that I'm saved, that you understand I'm safe with Jesus Christ, that doesn't change. That's my standing. But your state can change. You can go from a saved carnal man to a saved spiritual man, but you can never go back to being a natural man. Amen. Now, it's important that you don't equate this. And here's why, if you'll just give me three or four seconds here to work out where I'm headed to give you an idea or a concept. The mistake that people make is, is that when it comes to spirituality, it is an act of doing things. That's not spirituality. I'm going to show you some things that you can do, but they should be the results of fruit born in your life, not just because, hey, I'm going to do these things, and therefore, because I'm doing them, then I'm a Christian. Being a Christian means you made a decision to discipline your life. The disciples, the disciples, the disciples comes from the word discipline. The disciples first be called, were first called Christians at Antioch. That means there are certain disciplines or things that I will have as a part of my life 
that are indicative of helping me to maintain my spiritual walk, but not my salvation. If you don't understand that delineation, ladies and gentlemen, you will always be looking at your works to determine whether or not you're saved and or to determine your fellowship. You can't determine it by your works. There's times where works ebb and flow. There's times where you're able to witness and go and to do and that kind of thing. And then there's a season where you're sick or you need some rest or some things begin to change. It doesn't mean you're any less spiritual. It just means that you're taking a bit of a sabbatical. Here's Jesus Christ. He goes down and he heals a bunch of people and he feeds a bunch of people. He tells the apostles in Matthew 14. He says, go over there and get in that boat and row over to the other side and I'm going up in the mountain apart to pray. Was he any less spiritual there than when he was doing miracles? No, he's the same one. He just wasn't as active with other people. But at that particular moment, something that I want you to grab there is his relationship with the Father took priority or precedent over him getting to the other side. And if as a Christian you'll understand that, that when things begin to unhinge, it's not get more and more busy. It's get closer to the Lord. When things begin to kind of go south in your Christian life, it's not, well, you know what, I just need to go to more church and listen to more Bible and I need to do more praying and all that. No, you need to get back in fellowship with the Lord. Your salvation is sure. Do you understand? So we're going to talk this morning about a carnal man and a spiritual man. I'm going to show you some delineations between those things and try to help you get that firmly set in your mind before I'll give you some comparisons, some illustrations with Saul, some illustrations with Absalom, some illustrations even with the, uh, the Pharisees that are in the Bible. The Pharisees were the ultra, what we would call the Bible believers of their day. Just so that you know, in the beginning, the beginning concept of a Pharisee was that they were to be separated from the Gentiles. That's a good beginning. It's when they carried that separation to an extreme that it separated them from Christ. So independent, fundamental, King James only, Bible-believing, street-preaching, hell-hating and heaven-loving Christians can sometimes get to the point that they break their fellowship with the Lord because they get so separated that they can't reach who God sent them to separate. Now this is where some of you are going to struggle. A lot of people preach, uh, preach a Christ that is here to put you in chains. He came to set you free. Amen. That freedom means that I'm now under the law of Christ. I don't have to worry about a rule for everything. I got inside me the Holy Spirit that tells me what I can do and what I can't do. And so if I sit down with a Catholic on a Friday and it, uh, they get ready to have you know roast beef and tenderloin they get ready to have fried chicken and so on and so forth I have learned it's better for me to have fish or don't have any meat at all you say yeah but you have the liberty to do that I do but for whatever reason if I'm going to try to reach the Catholic it's not compromise for me to not get him in an argument over whether I should or shouldn't eat meat on fish Friday now, that's more prevalent. It's an old illustration, but it's more prevalent nowadays that you have to know that sometimes when you're around a weaker brother or an unsaved person, there's things that you may have the liberty to do that, you're not, that you can't do, not and maintain your testimony. But never think that that liberty is an occasion to the flesh. This is where the other group runs off into the hyper-dispensationalists and now, well, it doesn't make any difference. I'll be all things to all men. And so now I run off the deep end and now I'm out there and I look like the world and I act like the world. And if somebody were to look at me, they wouldn't even know I was a saved individual. Is this staying with you so far at all? I want to give you the right balance to those kinds of things. A Christian has to understand that when I say that, that you can't take that carnal way of thinking and run off the deep end with that. It's never intended to take you completely your flesh and just give it complete free reign. But it is to help you to understand that if I'm serving Jesus Christ, I don't feel that bondage. 
I don't feel that when the Lord tells me, don't listen to that, don't look at that, don't think about that, I don't feel He's restricting me or restraining me. I feel He's helping me. Remember the prodigal in the Bible? Everybody knows about the prodigal. Remember the prodigal in the Bible? The main fundamental problem with the prodigal was this. He thought the father's house was a prison instead of a place of protection. When God draws perimeters, it's not because He's trying to put you in prison. He's trying to protect you. You have a bunch of little ones. They're growing up around here now, and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And they need, You need a bunch of pickle barrels around here, especially for those seated on the front row to my immediate left. But one of the things that you have to recognize is, is that as the kids begin to grow, you give them a little more liberty, but don't you watch them cross the street? Well, you're just trying to imprison them. No, you're trying to protect them, right? Because there's things they don't know. You see a goofy guy coming around and he just doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. You don't say, hey, let's go test it out. It's like, stay away from that guy. He's a freako. We don't want to be around him because, you know, my spidey senses are tingling, right? So it's the same thing when it comes to the relationship with the Lord. If you're in fellowship with the Lord, he'll give you the direction. You don't need a list of rules and regulations. That doesn't mean you're lawless. Every time I say that when I go somewhere, then all of a sudden the legalist will jump up and say, well, now hold on just a minute, and then it's, you know, pants and pork and haircuts and hemlines. Okay, well, I, I, I don't even have an argument. If you have to have a list of rules, look, I had general orders and SOPs. One manual was that big and the other manual was that big, let alone Florida state statutes, federal laws, and municipal ordinances that we had to do with my previous employment. Well, now I'm under the law of Christ. I'm looking for more, not more things that I have to do, I mean that I can't do. I'm looking for things that I can do. So your approach to the Bible is if every time you read it, it's what have I done wrong now? You're going to find in the Bible just exactly that. You're going to find out you just keep messing up. How about you go to the Bible with a different heart? And when you look in that Bible, you know what you do? You begin to see things. You know what? I could learn to do that better, and I could learn to do that better, and I could learn to do that better instead of I've just always messed up. doesn't always have to be in the negative context. I realize there's a lot of positivity in the world today and those kind of things, but as Christians, it's not our job to try to offset all the positivity. I mean, as a Christian, I'm saved. To me, there is no better time than right now for you to have an opportunity to reach people because you got a pandemic thing going on and literally people are petrified. Look, we've lost people in our church. I lost a very dear friend of mine, 45-year friend I've had for 45 years I lost. People have died during that thing. I'm not making light of that, but ladies and gentlemen, I know where he is. I know where the other folks that have died that are in our church. Well, the world is looking at us, and if they see us wringing our hands and all that, we lose a great opportunity to step in and say, hey, you know what? I know in whom I am believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep me against that day. Are you in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Is it making sense? I hope to try to keep you awake. I'll just keep you for about, oh, another 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll take a, a bathroom break, and then we'll go a little bit longer and... Hopefully over the next couple of days you'll have a couple of things to get it. Now watch. The Bible says this in verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat. Hitherto were you not able to bear it, neither yet are you able. The first two verses are very important things to point out to you. First of all, a carnal Christian, that's not an unsaved person. That is a person, carnal, just it means the word like, uh, like chili con carne, that's like our carnival, it's just flesh, that's all it means. So it means in Galatians 5, if I walk in the flesh, I won't do what the Spirit tells me to do, and if I walk in the Spirit, then I won't do what the flesh tells me to do. It's the old saying that the old preacher used to preach all the time about the black dog and the white dog. He likened the black dog to the flesh and the white dog to the Spirit. See, preacher, everybody's heard that a million times. Yeah, but you can't beat the illustration. The illustration is, is that whichever dog you feed the most, when they fight, and they will, that's the one that's going to win the race. It literally is the key to a successful Christian life. But you have to feed every day. And it's more than just read your Bible and check off your 10 chapters. And it's more than I prayed for 15 minutes today. And following a list of rules, it's a matter of, am I getting anything out of what I'm reading? Or am I just speeding through the Bible to say, I read my Bible through in a year? but I don't really know what I read. You ever been reading your Bible in the morning 
or any time, whatever time that you happen to be reading it, and you've read, and the next thing you know, you, you know you're reading, and you've gone about three chapters, and then you look down and go, what did I just read? Has that ever happened to you before? Well, so that's your flesh. The flesh turned it off. You say, well, the Spirit got it. It doesn't matter. Well, we'll give you a little secret here of how to get your flesh a little more under control. Every time you do that, we're going to go back to the last thing I remembered, and I'm going to reread the whole thing again. <laughs> It's like the altar in church. You ever have your flesh tell you, you know, well, you ought to, your spirit tells you you ought to get up and go to the altar, and your flesh says, you ain't going to the altar, man. You're crazy. These people are going to be looking at you, and these people are going to be paying attention to you, and you say, no, I don't think I'll go. You know what you do? You tell that flesh, I'm going to drag your hind into the Amen. altar as many times as it takes until when I get ready to move when God says, you're going to learn. Amen. Now, it literally takes some time to be able to do that. So the first thing you've got to recognize is, is Paul had a desire to give him more than milk. But because they were so carnal, they were so fleshly minded, he had to stay on that fleshly, that waiting pool, that sandbox sort of teachings and stuff. He couldn't teach them anything more because they couldn't take anything, couldn't digest any more than meat. He compares them to those that are babes. Can I say this to you? A lot of them were grown men and women. But he's comparing them and almost being sarcastic with them. He's being a little smart with them when he says, but you're babies. I, I, I wanted to do that, but I've got a little milk bottle here, and I'm going to give you a milk bottle, and that's all you can take. And so step number one in a carnal Christian is that you can only take simplistic things. The heavier things that we're talking about are not all those intellectual things, the gap and all the other things that are in the Bible, and there's no question about them being there. It's the application of things that discipline or harness your life. A, a baby says, I'll take the milk and then I'll, you know, soil my diaper and I'll cry when I want to cry and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do what I want to do and I'll pitch a fit if I don't get my way. That's what a baby does. Uh, a more mature Christian begins to learn or an adult begins to learn that what I have to learn to do is to discipline myself that right now is not the time to scream out. Right now is not the time to be selfish. Right now is not the time for me to get what I want to get. Right now I have to apply the harness, the bit, the bridle to my own life. You live in a world today where even Christians are running hog wild. Because the Lord says, you know, well, because the sentence against uh, evil is not executed speedily, then... You know what happens? Even Christians go, well, I've done it. The Lord's not knocking the tar out of me. Don't ever mistake His mercy and grace for condoning what you're doing wrong. So the first step here in the carnal Christian is, is they can only get milk. So a lot of your churches that are around today, and this has nothing to do with whoever anybody else is uh, or whatever anybody else is doing, but let me make this clear. All they have is messages on salvation. And what you'll see is a bunch of carnal Christians that are there and they've never grown spiritually. Growing spiritually requires discipline. It's like going to the gym. You're not going to be able to lift any weight if you don't at first go to the gym. And then once you get to the gym, if you don't walk through the door and actually go in there and pick the weight up, you're not going to change as far as exercise, right? Or running or make any application that you want to make. Here's the issue. If I walk in the gym and I just stand around the gym, you know, well, I went to the gym today. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> it's like the woman, right, she is uh, about 90 years old and she was kind of having the um, body parts were in wrong positions and things like that. And she walked out in her bikini and the guy said, hey, I'd love to use you as a picture. And uh, she said, oh, really? And so she took a pose and they hung the picture out of the gym and, she's, and the, the picture under the label underneath the picture said, don't let yourself look like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, a Coke bottle kind of went to a mayonnaise jar, you know, and that kind of thing. Ah, oh, Sorry. <laughs> So y'all laughed at me first, so it's okay. So, so I walk around in the gym and I say, you know, I went to the gym today. I went to the gym five days this week. Okay. What did you do when you were there? Well, I mean, I went to the water cooler and I took a shower and I changed clothes and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but I've been in the gym five days this week. Now, it's a silly illustration. I, I've been in my Bible five days this week. I went, I mean, I... Well, what'd you read? What'd you study? What, more importantly, what of what you read did you apply? 
years ago when you'd go to a gym, they would put you on some kind of a training program, and then they would give you this little card, and when you would go in, you'd walk in the gym, and you'd go through the file, and you'd pull out your card. Now they have it on the phone or whatever. And then you go in there, and you're supposed to go through the routines, whether you had a trainer or not. It was according to what was written on the card. You could have a gym membership, and you could have a card, but if you didn't go to the gym and apply what was on the card, it didn't do you any good to be in the gym. Is that making sense to you now? You can be in a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. You can listen to it on YouTube and everything else, but if there's no application, there's no strength gained from just going to the gym. So what happens is a lot of Christians think that there's this metamorphosis that applies or that occurs that if I just read my Bible, then it automatically is going to change me. Some of you must believe that. Well, how's that working out for you? Aren't you still struggling? Aren't you still? You've got to apply the things that he wrote. It's not just a matter, I read it. Listen, uh, I, I don't want to ask that outright. That was rhetorical. Here, here's a question for it. I'll ask it this way, and you don't have to answer the question. Do you think if you read the Koran through ten times that it would change you? I doubt it would, really. I mean, you would read it. You may have increased in knowledge. You would know what they believe. But why wouldn't it work? Look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let me show you the principle here before I move on. Because some of you are thinking, uh, preacher, he's already gone apostate. He's in Bob Jones senior years and he's, uh, he's gotten too soft on us and that kind of a thing. Look in 2 Thessalonians. I'm not going to let you live that one down. Make it 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 13. This is the Apostle Paul. He said, For this cause also thank we, God, without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Look at the last part. Which effectually worketh in all that read. No, in all that what? Believe. So guess what happens? Millions of people have heard the gospel. Did it change them just hearing it? When did it change them? When they believed it. What did they do when they believed it? They acted on it. When I got saved, I believed what my dad told me the Bible said about going to hell. When I believed that, I had to say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I'm trusting you to save me because I don't want to go to hell. I had to act on what it is. Do you understand the principle? Just reading the Bible but not acting on it keeps you a baby. It is just, I, I heard the Bible. Yeah, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I heard the Bible. Yeah, but what about your gossip and your slander and your evil speaking? What about your envy and your strife and your maliciousness? What about your attitude toward others? What about Jesus first, others second, yourself last? Are you making any application of that? How about husbands love your wife and Christ loved the church and gave himself for it? Do you apply that? No man ever uh, hated his own body but loveth and nurse and cherith it, so Christ also the church. How are we doing with that one? Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There has to be an application of that. So, so when somebody comes to you, if I go to Brother Aaron and I say to him, uh, Brother Aaron, I'll be at your house at 7 o'clock tomorrow to help you paint. And he said, okay, I appreciate that very much. And then the next day, 7 o'clock comes, and he's like, uh, hey, preacher, where are you at? And I said, oh, I, I said I'd be there. Well, I know, but you're not here. Well, I know, but I was just talking. He said, well, preacher, that's ridiculous. You're, now you're lying. Yeah. I said I'm a Christian. The Lord said, okay, well, can I see some fruit, some evidence? Can I see something that shows that you are? Now, there's a guy not far from here. He's a little north of here. And one of the things he tries to teach on a regular basis is, is that, and I have to make this d delineation to make sure you understand, is that if you're saved, you're witnessing, you're going to church, you're reading your Bible, you're praying, you're tithing, you're giving over and above the tithe, you're involved in mission work, you're doing this, 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 you're doing this. And if you're doing all those things, I'll look at you and determine that you're saved. Nobody can look at you and determine if you're saved. If that's the case, Roman Catholics, a lot of them are more saved than we are. Mormons there, that's a good religious sect. I mean, as far as keeping rules and regulations, they're pretty good. I mean, 
when it comes to keeping rules and regulations. What I help, have to help you to understand is the performing of a duty that I'm going to some of the things I'll show you doesn't mean that you are the one performing the duty. The duty comes out of love for the Lord Jesus Christ and it's born out as fruit. And then that way, guess what happens? If somebody helps you or doesn't help, it doesn't matter. I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do. And then you don't get bitter like Martha did because Mary won't help her with the biscuits. You with me? Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is very important because sometimes in an effort to try to increase church membership or increase faithfulness, increase loyalty, we lay heavy burdens upon uh, individuals that are too heavy to be born. I can't force people to come to church to prove their spirituality during a COVID crisis and when they're worried about whether or not they are or are not being sick. That's their personal decision. I don't determine somebody's spirituality if they vote the way I do in a voting booth. You know, one preacher got up and slammed the pulpit and he says, you know, I don't believe if you're, if you're anything but a Republican, I don't even believe you're saved. Well, what a braying donkey. What about all the people all over the world that aren't Republican, Democrat, Tea Party, or any other division? Why is that even in the pulpit? Well, if you vote for so-and-so, you're not saved. Do you not find that a bit odd or strange? The guy that was in there the last time owns a bunch of casinos and a bunch of places that serve alcohol. And most Christians are like, yeah, he's the guy. You must have voted that. You're like, oh, yeah. Don't worry, I didn't vote for the other guy either. Y'all are like, well, well, yeah. But you see what you did was you chose the lesser of two evils. And then you're saying that that guy's the guy when, do you know what goes on in Las Vegas in the casinos? He owns them. But he's the one the Lord's going to use? Uh, okay. Wow, so you now what you said is, is, well, I can be a Christian and I can be involved in all that stuff. I'm not here to run the man down. I'm just here to say, see how you kind of shift a little bit? It's like, you know what, Lord, it might be better for me to just not put a mark on the paper at all because, or at least don't make it spiritual. It's not spiritual. It's a decision. You know why you pick who you pick? Because you think they'll further your carnal way of living. That's why we vote for mayors and we vote for senators and congressmen. We vote for the person that we think is going to lower our taxes and give us more. That's how we vote. Yeah, some of you are good and mad now, but I don't know what else to tell you. Are you not yet carnal? You say, well, how do you know? Well, let's go down a little further. Look in verse number 3. For ye are yet carnal. Because why? First of all, they can only take milk. For whereas there is among you envy, strife, and division... Are you not yet carnal and walk as men? You know what he says in that passage there? He says to him, he said, listen, you're walking like a natural man walks. An unsaved man walks. You've gone back to living that way. There's no distinction between the two. You're carnal. He didn't say you're lost. He says you're carnal. That means not you've lost your salvation, you're unsaved, or better still, you never got saved because I'm not. He just says you're just living a life after the flesh. Galatians chapter number 5 tells you if you walk in the flesh, there is a list of things that you are capable of doing. None of them includes going to hell or losing your salvation. You lose your rewards at the judgment seat. You lose your inheritance at the judgment seat, which we may get to a little bit later on, but I know you're very familiar with it and those kind of things. But here's what you've got to understand. I have to recognize or realize that I have a choice of whether or not to not be unsaved, natural. I have a, re a choice rather to be made of whether to be carnal or whether to be spiritual. Spiritual requires discipline. You say, why? It depends on feeding the dog. There's certain restraints you have to put upon yourself. Look in Romans chapter number 8, please. Romans chapter number 8. Do you yield to envy, strife, and division? Let me be careful how I say this. Some Bible believers are so caught up with fighting with each other that they never pay attention to their own spiritual growth. All they're interested in is winning an argument. What has literally consumed them every day when they get up is they have to go to their social media and they have to find out what's on some message board and they have to jump into the argument. They haven't looked to see whether or not they need to grow. They're just interested in winning an argument from whatever their particular point is about a myriad of things that are out there. 
Well, first of all, you may have maybe lost the main thing is, is my relationship with the Lord. And if my relationship with the Lord is what it ought to be, it ought to make me want to see other people saved. Those are kind of basic things. And then I need to grow some on my own rather than show my intellectual prowess by getting into some kind of an argument like I'm Dr. Bottle Stopper or Diddle Bob and I'm going to get out there and we're going to argue over, you know, whether the earth, here's a good one, whether the earth's flat or round. I had a guy walk up to me last year right before Christmas in the last meeting I was in and he said, you know, I've heard you say some pretty sarcastic things about flat earthers and things like that. And I said, okay. And he goes, I'll have you know that the earth is flat. And I said, okay. And he goes, no, I I mean, I want to have a debate with you about the earth's flat. I said, no, you win, it's flat. (laughs) He goes, you don't believe that. And I said, it doesn't matter. What, What is the point of the argument It's flat or it's round. We'll know at the rapture, but you win. The earth's flat. Now let's talk about something that matters. Because the fact is, is you're going to quote a bunch of scientists and I'm going to quote a bunch of scripture and you're going to show pictures and then I'm going to say photoshopped and then we're going to go round and round and round. I don't care if you believe it's flat. Okay, good, great, fine. I'm just soon leave a flat earth as a round one any day. I don't care. It doesn't, it's this big conspiracy. Why are Bible believers involved in that? Why are we consumed with things that don't literally amount to anything? And what it does is, is the carnal man is so interested in winning an argument that he yields to envy, strife, and division. So we have divisions in our crowd. I'm not talking about the other religions. We've gotten to a point we don't fight Catholics and Charismatics and Muslims and Church of Christ and Unity and all the other ones. Nowadays, what we do, we fight each other. You know, you know, you want to fight? I don't know. We'll fight. What is that? That's carnality. Envy, strife, division. You walk into church, it's kind of like you're waiting for somebody to knock the chip off your shoulder. You know, somebody sat in your chair, somebody parked in your parking place, somebody painted the wall a, a different color or something. Well, if they'd have done it like I said, it ought to have been done. Okay, well, big deal. I mean, it wasn't done that way. What's, what, let's get into the book and let's see what's happening, right? So the thing you have to recognize is if your propensity is, is to always be caught up in that, the Lord's given that to you as like a checklist. And it's like, listen, if that's what you're worried about and consumed with, that's defending your flesh. And if that's what you're doing, you're carnal. That's the Lord saying that. That's not me. He said one of the nomenclatures, one of the signs, one of the indicators of an individual that's carnal is they are constantly caught up in envy and strife and divisions. All right? If that's your life, good. You're in the right place because I can move you out of that and show you what being spiritual is all about. But you have to realize you're not here to clash swords with everybody. It's not always about let's have some kind of a fight. I... I, I shudder to say this, in a, in, and I say it in a kind of a careful way. When the Lord says, sanctify them with truth, thy word is truth, it has to be an application of that truth for it to work. But none of us are Dr. Ruckman. And you're not fighting a battle that he was fighting over the King James Bible anymore and all this other stuff that's now out there. You say, why? It's just for carnal Christians to just be fighting all the time over something as if that establishes your Christianity or your spirituality. It doesn't establish anything. Oftentimes, all it does is show your ignorance. It's like, why are you even arguing about that? You ever uh, have, if you have kids around the house, you have more than one kid, you ever get ready to have dinner time, time, and they get ready to come to eat, and they can't quit arguing and quibbling with each other to come to the table and sit down and shut up so they can eat? Do you know how hard it is to eat spiritually when you are caught up with arguing with everybody all the time? You say, why? The Lord's getting ready to put out spiritual food. And when he gets ready to put spiritual food in the trough, if all you're doing, you're already filled up with milk, guess what? You're not going to want to eat any meat. Are you in Romans chapter number 8? Look in Romans chapter number 8, please, and look in verse number, pick it up in 5. For they that are after the flesh, this is profound, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. So you still have those rules in place. If I'm going to be saved, but I'm going to continue to act like a lost man and drink and smoke and do dope and all that other, well, guess what? It's going to kill my body. My body's not protected. My soul is. 
And so he says, uh, for be carnally minded is death, spiritually minded, life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enmity, it's against, it's a hatred, it's hostile against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed, look at that. So then they that are in the flesh... You say, when I preach what he's talking about as an unsaved man. Well, you compare that to Galatians 5, and you can make a practical application for this. If I'm going to be saved, and I choose to live after the flesh, I am contrary to God at that moment. My soul's saved, but half of me is against God. And they that are in the flesh can't please God. So the question would be this, and it is rhetorical in nature. Do you want to please God? Oh, yeah, I do. Well, then it can't do it with religious service. See, you thought I was going to say, well, then you can't do it and drink and smoke and cuss and chew. No, I have people, our crowd, they don't drink and smoke and cuss and chew. They just look down their noses at everybody that does because they're spiritual. So they're always, I'm, I'm, I'm above you because I'm so much cleaner and I'm cleaner than a hound's tooth. And yeah, and crooked is a dog's hind leg. Have to screw your socks on you when it comes out because you do the business deals and nobody sees. You know, you do the stuff and where nobody can watch you. But out in public, you got the the veneer on. So, so, man, it's already five minutes till eleven. I must have been talking a long time. Um, let me, let me. Can I give you? <laughs> can I give you one more, please, real quick? Give you two more. Look in Ephesians chapter number five, and we'll take a short break. I know you need to get rid of that morning coffee. Um, it, this stuff isn't intended to bore you, but I, but it, but it, if you can't tell, I'm pretty passionate about it. It's the practical exercise or walking out of your faith. It's the thing that is so disdained among other people because we've turned it into almost this religion kind of a thing instead of a relationship. It's born out of a relationship. It's like your marriage. I've been married for 41 years now, and, you know, she does need to get the Congressional Medal of Honor for putting up with me for that amount of time. But, but here's the bottom line. Uh, over a period of time, we both had to make some adjustments. She's not the same woman she was 40 years ago. I'm pretty close to what I was 40 years ago. But, <laughs> but in all honesty, you know what's had to happen? It's not just physical things that have changed. Mental things have changed. Emotional things have changed. There has to be an adjustment along the way in order to keep the unity, right? So as you grow, your relationship with the Lord has to grow out of the crib. And eventually you have to recognize as you're beginning to change, the Lord is there saying, you're trying to grow up into Him, right? So if I'm going to be able to do that, i got to be willing to make, here comes the Baptist cuss word, changes. And most of us, we would just rather stay status quo, except everywhere else. You take a job, you want to get promoted so you can get more money. And you will adjust your attitude and your skills in order to obtain that better position to make more money to give you more benefits. Is that a fair statement? You don't want a child to remain in the crib their whole life. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but that would be called retarded growth. Meaning if the child's not growing, something's wrong with the child. We want the child to grow out, stop being a brat, and then eventually they get into being teenage years and you're ready to sell them on the slave market. And then at the end of that time, you're hoping that they come back and live the right kind of way and grow up and serve Jesus Christ, right? Don't you expect changes to take place? What's the purpose of discipline? Isn't it? It's not just to correct, it's not just to punish the child, it's to correct the behavior, right? So whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Well, why is he doing that? It's not just to punish, it's to correct the behavior, to help you to grow. If I had a glass up here and I had a whole big old wad of Play-Doh or whatever, and I shoved it down in that glass, in order for it to be conformed to that glass, all of it's not going to fit in the glass. Some of it has to be shaved off. So what the Lord wants to do is he wants to see you grow up into him, but some of us has to get shaved off. For some of us, a little more than others, but some of us have to get part of that shaved off, right? Amen. So spiritually, in order for you to grow, you have to recognize that when the Lord puts his finger on something, he goes, okay, we need to knock that edge off. We need to knock that corner off. We need to get you where you can fit where you need to fit. Right now, you're not fitting. So what I need to do is I have to make those changes. Otherwise, my growth is stunted and I stay in the crib and I'm good at taking milk. 
but I'm not good at helping anybody else because I'm still in the crib. Look in Ephesians chapter number 5. Here's a sign of some growth that are there. Yield unto envy and strife as compared to a true Christian. Look in verse uh, 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Before you get into all the things he tells you not to do, you know what he said? He said, if you're growing up, you know what you ought to do? You ought to learn to love one another. Amen. Don't you love the passage in Ephesians 4.30? Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed the day of redemption, and um, be ye kind one to another. <coughs> Tenderhearted. <sighs> Forgiving one another, <laughs> even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. And he comes down through, let all anger and wrath and uh, put away with you with all malice and, and all and so on and so forth. That's the top part above the verse there. And then he comes into there and be kind one to another. You say, what is that? That's contrary to my flesh. My flesh gets hit, it wants to hit back. The Lord, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. You begin to see the difference? So if I want to grow, then I have to recognize I've got to grow one or the other. That means I've got to grow spiritually. One more Galatians 5 and we'll take a break. Galatians 5. I think I'll have it pretty well set up after this. Now, when Paul says that I was going to give you some things, but you're not able to bear them, this is what he's talking about. I can give you some things about living a practical Christian life, but you can't bear it because you're still a baby and you think it's all about you. You live in the most meistic, selfish culture that has ever existed on the face of this planet. And some of it comes because of all the social media stuff and a lot of it comes from the computer and the televisions and they make you think that you're the center of the universe. So they have the universe shaped in this fashion where it comes down to a point this way where you're the center.